What happened in the last case you worked with tomorrow? That was good. So it wasn't. I wanted to start with this story because, like, let's be honest, most people will always think of you synonymously with Clarice Starling. So to see okay. you back in the detective story is like a completely wish fulfillment moment. But I wanted to ask you, what do you think it is about characters like Liz and Clarice that really resonates with audiences to the point where they want to journey with them as they try to find the bad guys? And maybe why you're maybe particularly drawn back to this um, part of the genre. I absolutely love Silence of the Lambs. I think it's an amazing movie, a classic, and was a perfect script to start with because it came from an absolutely perfect novel. Um, so I think that's what we have in common is that we have a really great script. Uh, and in that respect, it's because we have two fully complex female characters. Um, that's surprisingly rare. I don't know why, but it is surprisingly rare. That being said, I don't think Clarice and Liz have absolutely anything in common besides the fact that they grew up in a male-dominated uh, police kind of world, um, the Clarice from the FBI, but uh, and that may have impacted them. Uh, certainly Clarice is at the beginning of her career and Danvers is at the end of her career, so we get to see kind of a trajectory of possibility of where Clarice could have ended up. Um, but I, I, I don't think there's any two characters that are more different. Clarice is like a, a good girl on the good path, doing the right thing, very internalized. She has a very internalized trauma. And uh, Liz Danvers is, you know, a rebellious, mean-spirited, uh, has terrible jokes, lots of insidious internal bias. Um, she's unself-realized and unconscious. So she's, uh, she's kind of on the opposite vector. Hmm. I wonder if that's where Clarice ends up. That's a depressing thought, <laughs> but a realistic one in 2023, real talk. Yeah, uh, good question. One of the things like Silence of the Lens, I do think you also have is an incredible person at the helm of it. This time it's with Issa Lopez. And I know that you are a cinephile director, filmmaker in your heart, as well as an actor. Uh, one of my favorite memories of you is the introduction that I watch whenever I watch La Hine, uh, oh, Matthew, yeah, yeah. film. Um, but I'm just curious, what drew you to working with Issa? And I pray that it was a late night watching Tiger's Not Afraid because that's what drew me to her. Yeah, I was very, I didn't know of the movie until I was told that she was going to be directing the True Detective franchise. And, and uh, I read the script, loved it and thought like, oh, I can't wait to meet this director. Saw her movie, was completely excited about meeting her. And um, uh, we just had an immediate um, synchronicity, I think. Uh, I... I think she's my favorite director I've ever worked with. So she's, it's not just that she's intelligent, charming, uh, brilliant, but self-effacing, humble, funny, you know, all that stuff. But she's also like the first person on the dance floor and um, a hoot to be around. And maybe because we're both over 40 ladies, I'm a little more over 40 than her, but I think we understand the complexity of these female characters in a way that a lot of other directors and actors wouldn't have gotten to. The other thing I actually wanted to say with Issa too, I'm glad that you pointed that out because yeah, she's first one on the dance floor. Um, she's absolutely a riot, but I will say, knowing that you guys probably had so much fun outside of it, I love that you were able to sort of like make this compelling story. And I love the whole one more case and then you and I are done that you sort of give in this um, to Evangeline. I would love for you to take us inside that moment, both as a an actor, like yourself, working with someone like Kaylee, because I really feel like her portrayal as Evangeline is just kind of jaw-dropping. Kaylee Reese, just the most amazing actress, uh, five-time world champion boxer, four or five times, I can't remember. So many belts, I can't remember. She has a quality that I've really rarely ever seen, a kind of power that just lives within her. Um, it's just how she was born. Uh, and then also to have this very internalized, sensitive uh, vulnerability, a combination of those two things. What was really important for me was uh, understanding and shaking hands that this film is about Navarro's journey and uh, is about that central indigenous grounded voice power of the indigenous woman. and and to see the world through her point of view and to watch her change. And my character, Liz Danvers, is here to support that. So we kind of reverse engineered Liz Danvers in order to make sure that all of her issues kind of dovetailed, shadowed, mirrored the issues that Navarro needed in order to complete the journey of the story. Um, and that's really refreshing for me because, you know, 
I don't know about you, but there's a, there is indigenous representation out there, but it's just representation, which is first part of the equation, but not the last part of the equation. And uh, we really need to hear indigenous voices be central. I love that. Also, I'm so going to tell EC so that you're her favorite director. I'm sure she probably already knows that. <laughs> I can't wait to be like, girl, you'll never guess what Jodie Foster told me about you. <laughs> the night country, it takes us one by one. This isn't going to be good. Kaylee, thank you so much. I want to say that I really enjoyed your performance as Evangeline, and I cannot believe that this was your first feature sort of like job in Hollywood. I cannot believe that to begin with. But having Jodie Foster as a scene partner is probably the part of it that I would just die. So tell me when you found that out and when you found out, you know, you're going to be with Clary Starling in a detective story. Oh, well, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate that. It was surreal. I mean, it's just being, it's like going to see Pai Mei, you know what I mean? It's like the master of the legend. It was like something that I'm really interested in, want to get into and really learn. I mean, the universe provided and here I am with this opportunity to be telling this amazing story written by an amazing director and writer and then being here with Jodie Foster. I fangirled for like 30 seconds, but I had to, you know, keep my composure. That ring generalship that I have in the boxing room, I'm like, yeah, what's going on? Yeah, I watched a few of your movies, you know, <laughs> but it was amazing. Oh, so you put your boxer mode on as a way to sort of like guard you from the fandom? That's- Yeah, yeah. Inside, I'm like, ah. <laughs> Hey, I guess that's what you guys got to do. I mean, obviously you are at some point just actors on set and I'm sure just like athletes, you're always looking for what's the other person doing so I can maybe use that to improve. Well, did you have those kinds of actor conversations with Jodi or did she really sort of like, what did she sort of tell you about this moment to sort of pay attention to? Cause she's, you know, her first film was back when she was a teenager. She just had this natural curiosity to, to know what's going on in everybody else's brain. How do you create? She immediately had this very supportive, collaborative type of energy. It wasn't like, I'm here, you're here, you're the newbie on the, it wasn't, it was, I'm just here to support and tell this story and share ideas and knock this down and learn from you. And I learned from, you learned from me. And she was just so open and so bright and excited to share her knowledge. And um, she, wonderful person, sense of humor is off the charts. And she was just very personable, which made it easier for me having all this pressure, being the new person and kind of just watching her, taking little tips and how she deals with people and circumstances is one big thing I took from just her as a personality and so talented and, and educated and just, um, very smart. She has a very interesting brain. I, I love um, talking to her about anything. So funny that you mentioned Issa as this incredibly talented, you know, writer, director at the center of your tale. And I will say this, when you signed on to the project, she did not literally pull any punches. You have a lot of action in this. She's going to make sure she gets all of your sort of fight experience uh, in there. How would you compare training for this compared to what you're sort of like doing in the ring? Obviously you have the physicality, obviously you can do the moves, but was it one of those things where it's like you had to unlearn some stuff or was it maybe just an extension of what you feel you already do? Well, the endurance part of being an athlete and the repetition and training and preparing and also having to be present no matter what you prepare for is something I bring into acting. And I did have to kind of unlearn a few things because, you know, I didn't want to look like a boxer, but I've been boxing for over 20 years. But it also helped for me to be, I'm very self-aware of my body and physicality, so I know you know, where things are distant wise. And it also just helped, you know, that's something that I can bring to the table, the acting table that I have on one up on maybe some other actors that have to work really hard to get to the endurance or the, the discipline part of being an athlete as well. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about Issa and just her sort of vibe on set. One of the things Jody said, which I thought was an incredible compliment, is she's the favorite director that she's ever worked with. And she said that that was partially because of the vibe that she put on set. So I'd love for you to give a peek inside of what is the vibe of her set and, and how does that sort of help you guys as actors? She knows, first of all, she's an ama another amazing, highly intelligent uh, woman that knows exactly what she wants. And her brain and her creativity and her imagination is fascinating, which every word jumps off the page. And I'm like, how do you come up with this stuff? But she's so passionate and excited to share with the world and she wants to create and she's so excited. She calls herself a geek. Um, it's so funny, but it was fascinating to see how she can get what she needs and wants out of people in all different types of ways. The vibe on set was always happy. Hi, it, it wasn't, it was, we all had our job to do. We all were in it together and she was just so, I, I look up and admire her so, so much. Um, and it's like, do you ever sleep woman? <laughs> because I would be in the gym before or after we work and so wouldn't she. So she is um, a powerhouse, but it was another, she had, she handed me over at Navarro with all this trust and I just wanted to do the same thing and just do the best I could. 
Um, so knowing we had a trust uh, of one another and it was such a comfortable environment in such an uncomfortable environment, put it that way, a weather condition, as I'd say. I'm thinking stuff, bad stuff. I know, I feel too. Lisa, first of all, congratulations to think of us on a stage at Fantastic Fest talking about Tigers Are Not Afraid to now here, girly. I'm so excited about it. But I have to talk to you about joining this project, obviously a dream, but then the idea that you're going to be directing one of our supreme sort of like cinematic detectives in Jodie Foster, and then also being able to tell this story that I know you spent a long time sort of investigating exactly how you wanted to explore a new detective story with these types of characters. Yes, I mean, it's a dream come true, truly, you know, uh, as a fan girl myself, as a geek um, who watched the series and loved it and missed the feeling that it gave, so, it gave us that first um, season and get the question from HBO, what would you do with this? It was like, seriously, I have ideas. I have ideas. So, and then go and think about how could you infuse it with the thing? And how could you infuse it with uh, unsolved mysteries that every geek loves, like the Diablo of Paz and the Marie Celeste. And, um, and then uh, when they said, we're listening, I went back and I rewatched the first season and I saw that the massive influences, it felt really like Seven. It made me feel like Seven. So I rewatched Seven, which holds amazingly. Seven in itself is a season of True Detective. Seven itself it ha would have never been born without the Silence of the Lambs. So I go and I watch that. And honestly, that's the origin of all the subgenre of creepy serial killers with the mented minds. And, um, and I thought, let's have Jodie Foster. You know, it's, um, she's, she's how it, this all started. And she was magnificent in that, as she has been in many things. But we don't see her as often as we want. And we've never seen her for several episodes of a whole series, you know? So what a luxury. So I wrote this with her in mind. And, um, and when he, she said yes, I simply couldn't believe it. It was a dream come true. And, uh, and here we are. I love this so much. Um, I will say the fact that you also got her to sign up, um, knowing that you were going to be shooting in some very rough conditions, I think is a bigger testament because this is not the south of France where she's kicking it most of the time. So talk about setting the feature in Alaska and really sort of how you guys then shot it in Iceland and what you felt that really added to the narrative. And how early did you put that into the scripts? I think that was possibly the first thing I wrote. The very first line I wrote thinking of, of this story was a Western in the ice. And uh, so the ice was there already. And the moment that you think about True Detective, it is a piece of Americana, a really, really twisted, dark, sinister piece of Americana. And, uh, and the ice in America is the Arctic. And the only place where you can find it like that is Alaska. So I decided to learn more about these communities in Northwest Alaska where the night comes and doesn't go away for months. And I learned a lot. I learned that 70% of the population there is Inuit and that there are Arctic research stations ne next to it. And, uh, and I started to piece together the elements that would create this story. Um, I went, I, when I started working on this, we were in the middle of the pandemic and lockdown and I couldn't go to Alaska. So I had to go to Alaska as best I could through social media and through listening to the radio stations and through research. But the moment that I could jump on a plane and go to Alaska, I did. And, uh, and I went to the communities and the towns that inspired my fictional NS. And, uh, and I wish we could have shot there but the truth is, uh, during the winter, which is when we need to shoot there, there is no roads. You cannot come by sea. The sea freezes and planes are subject to the winds. So it was unthinkable to shoot here. And, uh, and so we went on a hunt of what uh, town north of the Arctic Circle could give us the same landscape. Iceland has a thriving film community and uh, experienced crews and offered us an incredible tax credit. And honestly, Reykjavik is lovely and they have really good food 
and really good music. And I was like, this is it. And I think that was part of, of, of the charm of bringing Jodie Foster on board. She loves the ice, by the way. She, she's an experienced skier. She was ready for it in ways that I was not, certainly. But um, the next challenge was how to reproduce that Alaska, that also those, those Alaskan towns and the clothes and the food and everything in Scandinavia. So there was a lot of cooperation with the Alaskan communities and our supervisors and our producers in Alaska to make it real. I love that. Well, I have to get out of here now. I, we will talk longer about this yes. as we get close to all the Emmys, but I have to leave you with this. Jodie Foster told me that you are her favorite director that she has ever worked with. And I just, girl, put that on a book somewhere. Get it. Yeah, no, I'm going to, I need to make a clip of that and use it as my alarm in the mornings. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> 